there is a love holding us. There is a love holding all that we love. There is a love holding all. We rest in this love. Come let us worship. I invite you wherever on earth you are this Sunday to sing this opening hymn with us. So welcome to what might be the weirdest service we've had during the pandemic. Uh, my name is Nathan. I'm your senior minister. Uh, we have Steve and Nolan Babcock up in the sound booth and Lee working piano and music. So we're recording, we're recording this on Saturday uh, because who knows what's going to happen with this dumb storm. Um, and we're going to have it premiere live Sunday. So this is a little bit of trickery stuff. Or, I mean, we're doing it live, but you're not watching it live. If you're here, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're watching. If you're watching this after the storm, glad you're watching. Um, just glad. If you need something as this storm approaches or has gone past, please email the office email address. You can find it on the website. We will be responsive. Allison, in particular, has promised to be responsive if and when she has power. So uh, those are kind of all the things you need to know. We had a lesson planned for today. It was going to be a great lesson for this theme. Um, we, the concept of the lesson is it comes out of, it's called Welcome to Holland. And the concept is when you're counseling a patient who just finds out they have a life-changing uh, diagnosis, so like a vision or hearing loss or something like that, and the, the advice they give to medical professionals is to tell them that, think if you were planning to go to Brazil, you packed your bags, a vacation, you have all the stuff you need, you know, swimsuit, uh, sandals, whatever. And when you got off the plane, you landed in Holland. There's nothing wrong with Holland. There's a lot of great stuff there. But it's not where you were planning to go. And everything you packed is wrong. And you have every right to be mad and every right to be upset that you're not there. There's a lot of good stuff to be found in this new world. 
but it's not the world you planned for. Now, we did that, and Kathy did this whole thing where she was packing up her thing, and it, it just felt off for what you may be going through as it relates to the storm and evacuating or staying put. So we, we scrapped it. Kathy was generous with saying we should, we should just put it aside. She did a lot of work. So just pretend Kathy did some great stuff and you're all inspired. Because uh, she did, you just didn't get to see it. Um, and now, because we don't have a lesson video, we're going to transition into the stones. And I'll do that by going to that mic. And I know that there's a lot that y'all are going through right now. In particular, we have two names to lift up, a happy name and a sad name. Uh, the first is Kai Robert Nyland was born. So this is Steve Ross's grandchild and Rebecca Ross's a new child. And also, member of this church, David Holly, his mother died this week. So we're gonna place a stone for Katie Maxwell and her family. So now, whatever it means in this, this world, take some time for this ritual. Take whatever's on your heart, whatever's on your soul, find a stone, place it in, um, in a symbol of your faith to be a little more present with us for this one hour. I invite those who wish to come forward virtually as we place stones. And would you say with me, with hope to make this a better world, we light this flame. Its light is a symbol of the power of love. So today is not at all the service that we had planned when we first conceptualized this. And it's exactly the service that we had planned. When we started talking about it, we knew that today would be tomorrow. When you're watching this, if you're watching it on Sunday, would be the 16th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. And it would be within the week of the anniversary of Hurricane Laura and five years after our 2016 hell summer. I didn't know we'd be preparing for a hurricane. So a few of the logistics, um, these are recorded, these elements you're seeing right now from the chancel we're recording on Saturday. Uh, there are some recorded elements that I recorded on Friday. Uh, the tone of the recorded elements is off. When I recorded them, we were probably feeling about 60% pandemic, 40% hurricane in terms of the energy. Right now, the way I'm feeling Saturday, and God knows how we're going to feel on Sunday, is about 85 to 90 percent hurricane, 10 to 15 percent uh, pandemic. So pretend those proportions are off. We're still going to go ahead and run with this service. So the theme this Sunday, we're talking about remembering the future. It's not a very clear term uh, that I thought of, but this is what, how we're going to describe it. It's almost a memorial of sorts. It's a way we deal with grief after trauma. All of us had a future. We planned for it. We packed for it. We looked forward to it. And then something came in there and fundamentally changed it. That's where the idea from the lesson you didn't see came from. So today, we are going to spend some time remembering the future. We're going to examine where we are right now with the state of the world and the pandemic and this hurricane and all the other stuff, frankly, I'm sick of talking about. 
And also this Sunday concludes our month-long theme of beginning again in love. This church has been encouraging you to spend some time, some of the time of this particular shutdown, uh, this particular shutdown surge time, reflecting on how we can start over again, but this time doing it with an even more loving heart. I invite you to uh, sing along with this next hymn. So I'm in a strange spot, spot with this pandemic and this surge. I've never felt more clear that good days are ahead and more um, bogged down without any way to see what is coming next. I don't know if you feel the same way. So here are the things to remember. As soon as we hit 20 cases per 100,000, we will open up services in person again. When we do that, we will start streaming the nine o'clock service. Uh, so we'll take the 1015 service that we used to be online. We're gonna move that to stream the in-person nine o'clock service. Then during that 1015 block, we're gonna have programming outside. Uh, Kathy is thinking that these are mostly, mostly gonna be programming focused on building community for different ages, uh, helping us practice being together again as people and then at 11.30, we will have the in-person service. So as soon as we hit 20, we're going to do that. Ignoring what this hurricane will do to the numbers. Right now, it looks like we're starting to see the numbers slowly go back down. Now, it's possible that schools coming back into session will bump the numbers back up. Uh, so I don't know when or how soon it'll be. But at some point fairly soon, the numbers will start to drop. Every other surge has dropped in parts of the country that have had the Delta surge. 
those numbers dropped. Um, and they didn't have access to the vaccines in the way that we do. So it's gonna drop at some point. We're not there yet, but we will get there. And here's what's so strange about where we are right now. I genuinely feel like things are about to get much better and for a lot longer. We have access to the vaccines. We have ways to keep ourselves safe. Uh, and we have a better idea of how to navigate this virus. The uncertainty of last year has made way for a much clearer way to navigate this. We don't have to wash our groceries anymore. We don't have to quarantine the mail. We're in a different spot than we were a year ago. And I'm also having a hard time making any plans at all. We're about to launch into um, all kinds of visioning and visioning for the church this upcoming month. Uh, keep an eye out for that. We're gonna think about what a uh, second minister could look like in this church. And uh, we're gonna actually start a strategic planning process. We're gonna look at all of the exciting ways that this church can sustain itself and fund itself at a time that a lot of UU churches are really struggling. This church is doing okay, and when we open up, we're going to be doing even better. And yet, I have a hard time pulling out of the hurricane, pandemic, political mud pit. By that, I mean I have a hard time making any plan or thinking about what the future could hold because just about every time I've started to look forward to something, this pandemic has swept in and taken it away. Not so much March, but April and May and June, they felt great. And then this stupid pandemic came in and took it away. I haven't forgotten that I called it that. I felt stuck trying to see what a future will bring. I've replaced all of my uh, spiritual and theological reading with study of the pandemic. Seriously, I haven't picked up a theological book in months. At first, I was curious why I wasn't doing my job. And then I realized that I've spent most of my study time trying to figure out this pandemic, trying to figure out what it's doing, what it's doing to us. Um, this is sort of the most real life example of the um, seeing what God is telling us right now through our own lived experiences. So every week I listen to three pandemic-related podcasts. Three. One of them, the most boring of the three, is called The Osterholm Update. It's, uh, it's by Michael Osterholm. He's an epidemiologist in Minnesota. He's apparently one of the most trusted... I have epidemiologists I follow and the ones that I don't trust. <laughs> That's stupid. I don't want to live in this world like that. Not in like a sad way. Like, I want this world to go back to where I have other people that I root for. But anyway, this is one of the guys I listen to the most. He's kind of the most pessimistic um, or real, really grounded of the epidemiologists. If you really want to sort of do a deep dive into the boring epidemiology, this is your guy. Um, anyway, during his podcast last week, someone wrote in and asked him what the end of the pandemic will look like. So I transposed his answer. I cleaned it up a little because he did a lot of talking and I asked Kathy to read it. So it's going to, uh, you know, it's spoken to written to spoken again. So it's, um, you can listen to the whole thing if you want. But I thought it was a really good way for us to start thinking about what the future will look like. Uh, so I'll, you'll hear his answer now. I'm confident this pandemic will eventually end. A pandemic is a worldwide epidemic, so it won't end in one or two countries. It's going to have to end everywhere in the world. It doesn't mean that the virus disappears. It means that it comes into some kind of steady state relationship with us. We will have this ongoing tug of war with this virus forever. These huge waves eventually become a seasonal virus. 
I think that's very likely what will happen here. I don't know when that will happen. At this point, we're not going to continue to see these big, big surges that occur every three to six months. Once we get closer to 100% protection, either through vaccination or infection, we will see it slow it way down. It may become one where we have two or three percent of the population gets infected every year. I wish I could tell you that it's going to be a one day event where suddenly someone comes on TV and says, aha, we just hit the end of the pandemic. That won't happen. What will happen is you get more and more time like you experienced in the period of April, May, and June, where you feel like it's, diff it's a different world. That will happen, but it's got a ways to go yet. Before we get that kind of May, June time period feeling again. See, I told y'all, heavier pandemic uh, quotient than maybe people are ready for with the storm. But uh, it is what it is. It's weird to ask you for an offering where we are right now. But uh, for those of you who feel generous, please give. Uh, actually, no, I'm going to rewind. We always need to be generous even when things are hard uh, because things are always harder for a lot of people. And this is the conclusion of our shared, this month we're sharing with Humanities Amp, one of the, just a phenomenal organization that is doing a lot of good outreach to a lot of the young people in this city. So this is a bad week to to have to share it unless you all really, really feel generous, uh, like you're doing it, you're in a good spot. So let's have a spiritual practice, even this week of giving. giving. I'll now invite you to give very generously as this morning's offering is given and received. The first wave came with urgency, a sudden knowing that everything must change. A sudden knowing that everything must change. We wouldn't take no for an answer. We must all act differently. Stop the danger, prevent the harm. And some of us, so many of us, thought that it would be okay. Things were different now. We knew better. It's the right thing. Do it for the vulnerable. Everyone is vulnerable. Everyone is vulnerable. Everyone is vulnerable. Everyone is vulnerable. Until we noticed, one by one, that it wasn't different. Those in danger always knew. This isn't news. Nobody is ever safe until we are all in the game. Nobody. That first wave never ended. Just our imagining that things would be okay. The next wave is the critical one, where we decide that dying for any reason is not a wager. We can justly entertain for anyone but ourselves. The next wave is a critical one, where we, decided, where we decide that dying for any reason is not a wager. We can justly entertain for anyone but ourselves. 
The next wave is the critical one where we decide that dying for any reason is not a wager we can justly entertain for anyone but ourselves. The next wave is the critical one where we decide that dying for any reason is not a wager we can justly entertain for anyone but ourselves. All right, so I decided to film this section in the listening room. Um, a lot of good it's doing us right now. Uh, but because the listening room was created under the guidance of our late church member uh, and pastoral care director, Reverend Earl Ramsdell, right after Hurricane Katrina, when a lot of the members and visitors of this church needed someone to listen to their stories. Today is not going to be a time for us to revisit that storm. I'd imagine most of you are doing a lot of that on your own anyway. Instead, this is an acknowledgement that things are hard right now. That things were hard then and they will be hard again later. Uh, some of you are probably revisiting Laura this week or the 2016 flood or the, the Gustav or the whole list. There's been something really interesting that's happened as uh, when I've talked with you during this most recent surge. For the first part of the shutdown, almost all that I heard was anger, real, raw rage at, at quite a few things, us shutting down, uh, people who refused the vaccine, sort of these wicked politicians who are more interested in scoring cheap political points than uh, actually making us healthier. But then something shifted in this past week or so. Most of what I've heard from you right now is despair. Over and over, I hear people who just feel like things are hopeless or helpless, that we're gonna be stuck in this forever. I really believe we won't be. But the, for those of you who disagree or more, more importantly feel like you disagree, I want you to know that I see you, we see you, we hear you. This is a hard place to be right now. I read a prayer a colleague wrote uh, for this Sunday. She mentioned Haiti, the surge, Afghanistan, just a whole bunch of stuff that, uh, that are heartbreaks in our world. Most of the responses for colleagues were about how great it was, and it was a really beautifully written prayer. I hit on almost all the struggles we're going through, but my only thought was that I just can't handle this right now. And I think that's okay. Maybe I'm telling it for you. Maybe I'm telling it for me. I don't know. Right now, you have to take care of yourselves. Not all of us need to carry the weight of all of the tragedies right now. It's okay. Getting yourself cared for first makes it so you can have more capacity for love and grace in the future. So right now, if you are living with anxiety about this upcoming storm, or re-traumatized by the storms of the past, or if you are stuck by this pandemic, if you are grieving everything you've lost in this pandemic, if you are grieving the life you thought you would have, for the future you thought you would have, if you are falling back into depression or addiction or patterns that you know are not the way that you want to live, if your ancestors are yelling at you loudly right now, well, listen to it. Just know that we are here for you. There's a hymn that we're about to do. We are very careful when we use this hymn. It comes out of enslavement. It's a promise made by its original singers and all those who sang it after that while right now may, there may not be enough love or joy or hope, it's out there. No matter how desperate things may feel, there's more love out there for all of us somewhere. And we're going to find it one day.
action. The God that we know and we see hope and compassion, be with us on this day. And hold all those who are scared, all of those who are waiting, all of those who are anxious, all of those who are reliving what they've been through, who are grieving for what they would have had, who are missing someone they care about, who are afraid, who are angry, who are frustrated. Hold all of us right now. And help us know, while it may not be okay, it will be well. Help us know that no matter how hard it gets, how, no matter how tough it gets, there's more love out there, more hope out there, more joy. May we be converted into beacons of hope and love. May we be bringers of peace and joy. Amen. On the day when the weight deadens on your shoulders and you stumble, may the clay dance to balance you. And when your eyes freeze behind the gray window and the ghost of loss gets into you, may a flock of colors, indigo, red, green, and azure blue, come to awaken in you a meadow of delight. When the canvas frays in the curac of thought and a stain of ocean blackens beneath you, may there come across the waters a path of yellow moonlight to bring you safely home. When the canvas frays in the curac of thought and a stain of ocean blackens beneath you, may there come across the waters a path of yellow moonlight to bring you safely home. May the nourishment of the earth be yours. May the clarity of light be yours. May the fluency of the ocean be yours. And may the protection of the ancestors be yours. And so may a slow wind work these words of love around you. And so may a slow wind work these words of love around you. And so may a slow wind work these words of love around you, an invisible cloak to mind your life. An invisible cloak to mind your life. An invisible cloak to mind your life. You are essential. Your life is essential. Your body is essential. Your presence here, here in community is essential. If you hear no other part of the service, hear that. I know I'm sending you off into an uncertain time. I know that this week is likely going to be hard for a lot of us. So just remember that we are a congregation that has you and will make it through this together. In a few minutes, we'll close with a song that could not be more perfect for where we are. I don't know how many of you are here because, well, this pandemic, I can't seem to have any idea who is actually engaging with these worship these days. But the first Sunday of the shutdown, we had a guest preacher, the Reverend Retta Morgan. She was supposed to do an entire weekend retreat called a Heart Revival Weekend, which I guess we've been doing now for 18 months or so a heart revival. But when we shut down, she was scheduled to preach, so we brought her into this closed sanctuary. Um, I propped a laptop right here. We, we brought in a little, I don't know, a stand. We put the laptop on it. We did Zoom on that, and then we took my phone and logged into Facebook, the church's Facebook, and propped it like right on the laptop. Her and Kathy Smith led this song that we're going to close with. 
So as we go into this uncertain week, uh, we're hearing a, the choir's doing a rendition of it, but that was the first time this congregation heard that song. So as we go into an un, uncertain week, I cannot think of words more appropriate then or more appropriate now. The verses are, and I'll read them, as I read them, uh, think of them like a prayer. Don't give up hope, you're not alone. Lift up your eyes, don't despair. Don't you give up, keep moving on. I know you're scared, I'm scared too. But here I am right next to you. We'll make it through this week. This church is here for you. Amen. essential. Your life is essential. Your body is essential. Your presence here in community is essential. You are essential. Your life is essential. Your body is essential. Your presence here in the community is essential. Here we mourn the dead. Here we rage at injustice. Here we learn and grow, stretch and challenge ourselves. Here we remember what is greater than ours. Here we celebrate joyous milestones and many seasons turning. Our work here is essential because we are essential. Our work here is essential because we are essential. Not just those of us who are here, but all of our siblings of every faith, color, and identity. All of us are, are essential. Connected, whole, essential. All of us are essential. Connected, whole, essential. All of us are essential. Connected, whole, essential. There's a love holding all. May this church surround you with that love, an invisible cloak to mind your life. May you rest in this love. We'll make it through this week. Go in peace. Go in love. Amen. Amen.